right, we're going to add on to with honor. And one of the things I'm going to talk about today is honoring God's word. And the basic premise is how can we trust the Bible? So we're going to get into that in a few moments. We were supposed to start a new series today called God Never Said That, which I'm excited about in a couple of weeks. We're, we're going to tackle questions people have had like, well, God will never give you more than you can handle or isn't all, you know, things like that. These misnomers that people believe about God. It's about a four-week series we're going to start after next week. But as I was preparing for this week, I just didn't have peace about doing the message yet. I felt like I really needed to discuss and bring forth to you about current events that are taking place in our country to talk about what happened with the Supreme Court and things of that nature. But as I was praying about it, I felt the Lord said, don't deal with that directly. And, and as I was praying, because I realized that, you know what, the, the, the things that are going on in our country right now, the passing of different laws, that is a symptom of a greater problem. For example, if you're sneezing, you have a fever, uh, you're coughing, you're breaking out in hives, and so you can treat the hives or treat the sneezing, but if you're not treating the flu virus that's causing all these symptoms, you're going to be chasing your tail all the time. And so if we chase after all these symptoms of society and don't deal with the core issue, we're going to be wasting our time and frustrating ourselves. Another thing that concerns me, and maybe you're the same way, I have noticed that when things go wrong in our culture, such as 1973 with, with uh, Roe v. Raid and, and 1962, I think it was, prayer in school, all these things, what happens is the church gets upset about it and they go, oh, I can't believe this is happening, or a school shooting or, or something terrible like that. You notice that? We get upset about it. We talk about it. Now today we have the availability to go on Facebook, tweet it, Instagram it. Uh, tumble it, whatever you want to do, and you'll be able to express yourself and how frustrated you are with these events taking place, and you reverberate about it, send a link to a friend, and, and for about a week or so, we're, we're frustrated, we wring our hands, and, and we feel good about it because we're upset. But have you noticed being upset does nothing unless you put action to it? You can be upset about injustice, or you can be upset about violence in the schools, but if you just get upset about it and go, oh, that's terrible, Oh, the country's going bad. And we feel like because we're upset, we feel good about ourselves. And then we get bored and we go back on with our normal life, being busy. Then something else comes up, we get upset again. You ever notice that? I don't know about you, but I don't think that's very productive. I think God has called us when God alerts us and gives us passion and concern for various things. It's not for us just to get upset. It's supposed to be a catalyst for us for action. And so I, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of all that. And so I, I'm, I was thinking and I was praying, God, what's the real issue here? And as I began to pray about it, I think, you know, the real issue is this. People don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. They believe it has words of God. They believe it like the Quran or other you know, books or uh, different religious systems. It has value, but you really can't take the Bible at face value. After all, it's an ancient document. We're in modern society today. We don't kill people for gathering wood on the Sabbath like it did in the time of Moses who wrote this thing. It says, if your son disobeys you, go out and stone them. Not get him stoned on drugs, but go out and kill him. Okay? The Bible says that kind of thing. And, and, and so, well, well, gee whiz, you know, we don't do that today. And so you Christians are kind of strange because you pick and choose what you like in the Bible. And we've evolved as a culture. We have evolved. And you really can't take everything in the Bible seriously. Therefore, the things that are going on right now in our society in, in, in regards to marriage in regards to polygamy, in regards to all these things that are going to be coming up, euthanasia, not the youth in Asia. That is a problem too. But euthanasia is what? Is ending life early. Because someone doesn't want to live anymore. That, by the way, that's not going to happen. That's going to come to the courts as well. And so all these decisions are being made. And if you say, I believe the Bible, you're, 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 you're small-minded, you're antiquated, you're judgmental. But the question is this, do we actually believe this is the Word of God or not? And we need to understand why. 
And so today, obviously, I, it takes six, seven weeks to go through this in a classroom setting to, to explain the history of the Bible and how it was put together. And it, I, we don't have time, but I'm going to do the Cliff Notes version or other Holy Spirit version is better, right? We're going to go through it quickly. And what we're going to do is talk about several things. Number one, people misunderstand the Bible. They think it is a normal book that has a beginning, middle, and an end, but it's not. The Bible is a collection of books. It's like going to a library. There's a history section. There's a poetry section. There's a po uh, apocalyptic section. It talks about end times, right? There's all kinds of, there's poetry. There's love stories in it. And so the Bible has different types of writing in it. You cannot approach every writing the same. And it has a purpose behind it. So today we're going to talk about that a little bit. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how we have the Bible we have today. And uh, please, understand, there's no way within 35 minutes I can possibly answer every single question exhaustively. So please, you're going to say, well, what about, I understand that. But the basic premise is this. Do we believe the Word of God? How can we trust the Word of God? Because a lot of people are saying many different things. Churches are saying, well, you know, it's different today. And a redefinition of this and the other. And so we hear about this. And this is what I want to start up with a couple of scriptures. I'm going to break it down a little bit more. Uh, 2 Timothy, you'd be so kind to put it up there. 2 Timothy 3.16. You might have read this verse before. We're going to come back to it later. It says the following. All scripture is given by dictation. Well, it doesn't, oh, it doesn't say that, does it? And you see, and that's what happens. The Bible was not dictation. It wasn't like you're sitting in an office and your administrative assistant and you're saying, you're, you're, you're dictating a letter, and whatever you say, that him or her is going to write it down. That's what dictation is. Instead, it's inspiration. Inspiration would be basically um, trying to figure out, you go outside, you see the Grand Canyon, you describe the kind of rocks and the sunset, and with your personality, you describe it, and as a result, your personality comes through it, but it's still truth. It's inspired a little bit different than, it's not dictation. Let's continue to read. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine. Doctrine is the right way to believe. That's all doctrine is. If, for example, forgive and you will be forgiven. All right, see, and things of that nature. There's a doctrine. For doctrine, for reproof, means correcting. For correction, for instruction in how to live the right way. Righteousness simply means living the right way. That's all it means. It's not a scary word. There's a right way to do things and there's a wrong way to do things. That a man or woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. It also says, Jesus goes to Matthew 7, 24, says the following. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But he who hears my words and does not do what I say is like the foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And when the rains came, and all that came, it mighty was its fall. And I will say this. We'll discuss this at the end. All of us are going to face storms in our lives. We're going to face personal storms, national storms, world storms, and eventually a storm to face God face to face. And if your house and your life is not built upon the unchanging rock of Christ, there's going to be some serious problems that you and I will face, both on this planet and later on. And the, the, the funny thing is this, is that both houses look fine until the storm comes, and then its true value and worth is shown. So, ever hear the statement, you live and you die by your word? My friends, you and I will live and die by the words we believe and live by. So what does the word of God say about the Bible, and what happens with it, and how is the Bible written? I've heard people say this, the Bible is a owner's manual for your life. And I used to say that and quote that a lot. And there's some truth in that. On page 3-25, it shows you how to change your oil. On, on, on dash 325, it tells you how to 
deal with your children or your wife. And, and yeah, it may have all that, but you know, really, that's not really accurate depiction of what the Bible is. You know what the Bible really is? It's a story. It's a story of God and mankind. It's a love story about God and mankind. You see, in an ancient civilization such as the eastern side of the world, by the way, which the Old Testament came from an eastern culture, story was the transmission of ideas from generation to generation. And the Bible is a progressive revelation about God. And if we don't come to the Bible in that manner of understanding, we can find ourselves getting frustrated and misguided. Let me explain to you what I'm talking about. I love what John Olterberg said, and he does it so good that I'm using his, his, um, his scenes. It's all about scenes of a play. I think it does a great way of talking about that. And it's this, the biblical story. You see, to understand the Bible, you must read it as a revelation of God. And so here in 21st century America, is the Bible really relevant for us today? We're going to talk about it right now. It's often misunderstood. And this is the first thing, the biblical story. The first is act one in the play. You know what act one is? The creation of the world. And the amazing thing about the Bible, I'm not going to get into six literal days or six time periods. It's not important. But I will say this. The, uh, the, act, the actual stages of creation, science agrees with. I don't know if you realize that. Yeah, it does. Science agrees with the stages of creation. The question is the time, which is another time for another place, which I'm not going to get into today. You know, you're frustrated, and I'm not going to get to today. I'm sorry. If you want to take me out for Starbucks and buy me some coffee, I might talk to you about it. I had to throw that in there. Okay. So uh, act one is creation. And everything was good and perfect. Then we have act two, which is the fall of man. This is where we had Adam and Eve, right? And they fell into sin. We had the first murder, Cain killing Abel. And then later on, we have Lamech, who is from the line of Cain, who starts this whole thing called polygamy, which had multiple wives. And God worked through fallen man. And then there was what? The flood that happened? And then what, God, what did God do after that? He began to change the world by selecting a man which formed a nation to bring the courier of the good news of Christ to the whole planet. That person, by the name, his name was Abram in Sarai. He changed his name to Abraham, the father of many. And what happened was, God took this man and woman, and he made him a great nation, and he showed his providence and showed his plan through this man. And through that line, of course, came Moses. Then after Moses... Uh, Moses delivered his people from the uh, Egyptian bondage of over 400 years. And it was so amazing. This morning I was reading my Bible. I, I read through the Bible in a year, and I really encourage you to do such. I'm going to try to put it on our website. And today was a real exciting reading. It was Chronicles. Chronicles 1. And you know what it was? Genealogy. It's like, oh, I'm going to blow through this. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. No, no. I'm not going to blow through this. I'm going to read this. Who are these people? And I began to realize they seem insignificant. There's no story about some of these people, but every single person was part of the chain that brought God's will and brought David and then eventually brought Jesus. And it spoke to me saying, you know, all of us may not be heroes of the faith, but all of us have a role to play in bringing the kingdom of heaven to here to earth. You see, that's how the Bible can speak to you. And so there, God chose a nation of Israel. He says, I'll be, you'll be a father of many nations. And many people get confused with the difference between laws and culture. For example, the Bible talks about this. It says in Leviticus 1129, it says, of all the animals that move about the ground, these are unclean for you. A weasel, which I had no idea what that is. The rat, which I know from. Any kind of great lizard. A gecko or geico. The monster lizard. The wall is it, the, the, the uh, skink and, and the chameleon. Most of us have never even eaten these animals, and I hope you never have. But there are other seemingly strange things in the Bible, for example. It's just what it says in Leviticus 13, 40. This is what it says. And I, for some of you, this could be a place of comfort for you. When a man has lost his hair and is bald, he is clean. 
So <laughs> I am getting cleaner by the day. <laughs> and for you, those of you that have a full head of hair, God help you. <laughs> How about this in Deuteronomy 14.10? Any creature in the water that does not have fins or scales, you must not eat. So anyone had lobster, you are in deep kimchi. Kimchi is a Korean delicacy. That I'm not going to get into it right now. How about this one? Or we hear Deuteronomy 5.17, and we all, we're okay with this, and even the people that don't believe in the Bible agree with this. You should not kill. Of course we take that literally. But do we not eat shellfish anymore? Or how about this? Or someone is collecting wood, as it was in the, in the time of the Bible. A man was collecting wood on the Sabbath, and guess what happened to him? He killed him. That's why I don't chop wood. No, what happened was, you shall not work on the Sabbath. He that works on the Sabbath should be killed. If your child disobeyed you, you could stone them. Wait a minute here. So why do you guys uh, don't adhere to that anymore? But you say about marriage, about this and the other. You, but you just pick and choose what you want to. You, this is a barbaric book. No different than from the Quran because look what they did. They wiped out civilizations. They go into the city and wipe everyone out. How could the Bible do that? You see, you Christians, you just take, pick and choose what you like. And you're like, uh, uh, okay. Well, what does that mean? Well, let me explain to you a little bit more about what that means. We talked about as different types of, it's a, it's, a, it's a story. We had act one, act two. And then we come to something else here I want to mention to you about, about the different types of uh, nation of Israel through Abraham. And John Calvin, the church reformer, back in the 1500s, came up with something that's really good. He says there's basically three ways to look at the Old Testament. And if you look at it, you'll see it's true. This is what he said. So the first category of the Old Testament is called civil laws. You have to understand something. In the Old Testament, they did not have a constitution, did not have a Supreme Court. They, had, they were nomadic tribes, basically. And so what they did is Moses wrote these laws about how to kill an animal, how to take the fat off, how to present it to a sacrifice. And you might be asking yourself the question, why did they do all that? Well, you have to understand something. In the time of Moses, in the time of the Israelites, very few people had an education. And the way they learned was by object lessons. So when you went and you brought the animal, you realized that this represents you, the blood spilled out, and, and you go through all these things. And all of these things, by the way, would point to the great sacrificial lamb of all, Jesus. And by the way, all the scripture, which I'll show you a little later on, a little bit, does that. So these were object lessons to teach him something. But it was, it was basically for the sacrificial system. Talks about that. Uh, so civil laws. And what to do. And if a man does this, you should get in trouble with this. And it was based upon that. They, there was a constitution of their day, if you will. And, and number two, Calvin said this, the Old Testament also contains ritual laws. And those are religious and ceremonial laws. So you have laws of the land, how to pick up a tent and how to move things around. It tells you all that, by the way. And then it talks about ritual walls and how you're supposed to do things. All right? And all these things, by the way, were a foreshadowing of what Christ was going to do on the cross. It would be unthinkable to go back and not boil a mother in his, mo in his mother's milk. I mean, what is that all about? A goat in his mother's milk and all that kind of stuff. You're like, what does that have to do with anything? Well, that was for that time. Okay? So you have, you have civil laws. You have ritual laws. And then you have moral laws. And so within these, within these types of laws, within the ritual, and within also the um, civil laws, there is a principle behind the law you and I can learn from today, which I'll show you in a few moments. It would be unthinkable for us to go back, okay? For example, in Deuteronomy 6, 5, it says the following, which is timeless, says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Leviticus 19.18 says, love your neighbor as yourself. Moral laws show how people should live with clean hearts. You see, the Old Testament is not concerned with the mechanical legalism. The Old Testament laws were ultimately concerned about people having a clean heart before God. These were all ways to help you understand what God was calling us to do and, and do and say. And people get mixed up with these type of things. For example, let me give you another example. In Deuteronomy 24, 20, it, it's kind of an odd law. Okay, this is what it says. When you beat the olives from your trees, 
Do not go over the branches a second time. Now, anyone, if any of you beat your olive trees and go through it a second time, you're going straight to hell. No, what's the deal with that? Well, let me explain what it meant. Olive trees. They beat the olive trees and get the olives off. It says, don't go a second time. Why? Because you leave stray olives, why? To help the poor. Help the wanderer, help the fatherless. When you harvest your fields, do not cut the edges off. Why? Because it was at the heart, remember the poor. Do you see that? And so if you start quoting, well, it says you're beating all, no, you missed the point, okay? These laws were for moral, primarily. It was about the heart. It was about the heart. And even like slavery, for example, the slavery back in, you realize that the Old Testament's um, writings about slavery undermined the slavery in general. In the surrounding areas, they had no rights at all, but God gave dignity. He basically was dealing with a barbaric society. And God has to take a people where they are to bring, think about this, there are things that I used to do when I was 18 out of ignorance, such as robbing banks and stuff, that I know better not to do it. No, you know, there's things that I used to not know better to do. But now I know better because God has shown me through experience and through his word that I can't hide behind the ignorance I used to hide behind. And so God has progressed society through progressive revelation. He deals with us in our area. I've known people that have gotten saved and they're still doing drugs initially. And then they say, I, know, I don't think I should be smoking pot anymore. I had a conviction this morning. I read the Bible. Ah. Of course, we tell them the same thing. But I don't think it's right for me to live with my girlfriend anymore. I should get married. All right? So we're not going to just grab them and say, change everything. No. We're going to let the Holy Spirit do it in, in, in the time of their understanding. And that's what God did with society. So these kind of strange laws. You know, the Bible was written and, and where uh, all kinds of horrible things were taking place. It'd wipe out villages and wipe out people. But, you know, it's amazing how later on we come to the New Testament, and this is what Paul says about slavery. He says the following, Galatians 3.28, there's neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free nor male nor female. We're all the same value before God, and God cares about every single person. Do you see that? And so later on, we see a progression. Then we come after the nation scene. We come to Act 4, which is the life and ministry of Jesus. And Jesus is the fulfillment of everything in the Old Testament. Let me give you an example of that. The time was fulfilled. What does that mean? Well, in Luke 24, 27, after Jesus rose again from the dead, there were these two guys walking on the road to Emmaus. They were destitute, they were frustrated, they were scared because they heard that Jesus rose from the dead and they didn't understand what it meant and, and Jesus meets them along the way and he's talking to them about all the scriptures. That, Don't you guys understand about things? And I'll go ahead and read the scripture to you. I wish I could have heard this conversation. But I'll go ahead and read it to you. Luke 24, 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus, he explained to them, what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So Jesus showed the prophets, the Old Testament, and listen, these were all foreshadowings about me. And by the way, you want to be blown away? Read Isaiah 53. It describes the cross, what Christ went through amazingly. Read Psalm 22, it'll blow your mind. So all the scripture speaks about Christ as a progressive revelation about Jesus. So the whole creation, the fall, the nation of Israel, finally makes its, makes its uh, end game, almost end game at Jesus. But there's still another scene. And what's the other scene? It's Act 5, which where were you and I are right now. It's called the church. Jesus began the ministry by saving us. Now he says, you go and do the work that I did because I'm going to the Father. And so that's where we are now, Act 5. So if you read the Bible in the wrong way, you misunderstand it and misquote it. It's always been about the heart, all the time. Well, how do we know the Bible's the word of God? So there's a proper way of reading the Bible. I hope you understand that today. There's 66 books, all written over a 1,500-year period. 27 New Testament books, 39 Old Testament books. 
It was written over that a period of time. Well, how do we know what we have is the real deal? We've all played telephone. You've got a line of 15 people, and you say, uh, Jack has a red shirt, and he likes to watch the Yankees. And by the time we get to the end of it, it says he likes the Red Sox. <laughs> so if you can't even get a line of 15 people, then how can you trust this thing? Which, which, which you know, I mean, you think, yeah. That's because we're looking at the Bible and Scripture from our culture. Little do we understand that the people were extraordinary with their memories. And when they, and when they would translate these scriptures, they would count all, all the letters. And if there was one missing, they'd rip it up and start again. They were very careful about writing the Bible. Well, how do we know? How do we know the Bible's authentic in its original writings? How do you know it's not been changed from the original? I'm going to say this. It's the most trusted and the most verified book in the history of of the world unparalleled. There's no other publication. There's no other book, not the Quran, nothing that even comes remotely close. There's, if you think about it, it's a mind boggling. There's over 5,800 copies consisting of 2.5 million pages of text. In addition, we have more than 10,000 Latin manuscripts with a total of 22,000. And we have things going back from 400 BC to 30 A.D., 40 A.D., 50 A.D., 100 A.D. We have this span of time. Well, how do you know it wasn't changed? Because it's not like Paul Bunyan or Johnny Appleseed. What's amazing is this. One of the earliest copies we had of the New Testament was, I think it was about A.D. 200, the New Testament, the, the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses. Back in 1951, these guys were in Palestine. They were by Qumran area. They were throwing stones back and forth or something, and they, they heard something break. They went in there, and they, and they went into the cave, and they found a jar. It contained manuscripts from 400 B.C. You know what it was? It was the book of Isaiah. And you know what they did? They opened it up, and they compared it to the manuscripts of 200 A.D., and they were exactly the same. A few minor valves changed, but everything was the same. I had the opportunity to see a 4,000 4, piece in Israel, I saw the document of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was an incredible find, which shows the authenticity that the book you hold in your hand is the book that was written. Great care was given to the Bible, because very few people could write in those days. Also, uh, very interesting enough, Peter called, if you look at the book of Luke, it says, hey, uh, great Theopolis, I, I've gone through a special investigation where the, the, the Luke to, went on an investigative report. He interviewed eyewitnesses, he invented the apostles and other people, hey, you're the one that got healed, yeah, and he put together a two-volume work called the book of Luke and the book of Acts, which was a historical look at the early church. The Apostle Paul says in Corinthians, he says, if Christ has not risen from the dead, then your, your faith is vain. He says, There's been, he was seen by over 500 people, and you can talk to them, some of them today. So when the Bible was being circulated about 25 to 30 A.D., the Apostle Paul's writings were going around from church to church and church. You know what Peter called it? Called it the Word of God. He gave the Scripture, the Apostle Paul's writing, the same value as Scripture. And that's all part of it. And so what happened was, these scriptures were going around. Jesus quoted over 27 books of the Old Testament and said they are the word of God. Well, how do we get this canon? And by the way, a canon is not something you shoot a ball out to put a hole in a pirate ship, as my children would think so. What's the fascination of the pirates? I don't know. But nevertheless, a canon is a standard and so they put these 66 books together by standard. What are these standards that they had? Well, first of all, much of the Bible was already selected by Jesus himself, by the apostles, okay? And there was a standard. And what was the standard? The standard was this. They had to be an eyewitness or they had to know the apostles or Jesus. And most of the New Testament was written when the people were still alive. You had to ask questions. Now, that didn't really happen. It's like some of you in your football careers in high school. That didn't really happen. 
I was there. I, I went fishing with you. It wasn't this big. It was a little rainbow trout you had to throw back in because it wasn't big enough. So there are people to verify these things that were happening. And that's all part of it. So there was empirical evidence and internal evidence. And there's also personal evidence, which I'll get to a little bit later. So what also happened was this. This was the criteria. Was it written by somebody that knew Jesus or knew the apostles? Okay. There was, the, they call them, by the way, I, don't get confused here, they call them the super apostles. No, they're not superheroes, though they are superheroes in the real sense of the word. These were people that actually knew Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul was considered an apostle. Okay, you had the different writers of the New Testament worked with apostles. You had Luke who worked with the apostles, who traveled the apostle Paul. All right, and so these were eyewitness accounts, and they put these together, and there's more copies of the New Testament than any other publication in the world. That the, that the Bible you hold in your hand is authentic to its original writings. Hands down. I, I, I wish I could go into greater detail. I cannot at this time we have today, but I'm gonna just tell you, it is. So you have that. And then the councils put it together, the church history, about 100 A.D. to 200 A.D., they, they, they basically, there was circulation. It's almost like the circulation of books were going around. They were considered Scripture anyhow. So instead of having five or ten volumes, they put them all together in one volume called the Canon of Scripture. And it was a very strict thing. If it contradicted another part, it wouldn't be in there. So the Gospel of Judas or whatever, these other Scriptures that come up, they don't pass the test. They were not passed by the early church. The church fathers, uh, which the early church fathers which came after the apostles, didn't, did not give any credence to any of the books except these. And the other Gnostic Gospels don't work. That's a whole other issue. I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting too deep in the kimchi or the weeds. So that's all part of it. It's the Old Testament, the New Testament, the councils. Now, now that we've kind of established, I, I try to explain to you today the way to read the Bible. I hope, I hope that helps you just a little bit. Does that help a little bit, I hope? Yeah. With all the people saying various things? Okay, now we ask yourself the question, and this is the question we have to ask ourselves. All these cultural things about marriage, about divorce, about polygamy, about euthanasia, about gay marriage, same-sex marriage, or whatever, whatever it is, abortion, all these various topics that are going to continue to come up in our society. We either are going to live by the word of God or we're not going to live by the word of God. And this is the issue. When someone comes up to me and says, I'm a Christian, and say, I'm for this, which is against the Bible, I ask them the question. I don't even waste my time anymore asking what they think about euthanasia or same-sex. I don't want to waste my time. I said, what's your view of Scripture? And the, the answer they give me determines what they're going to be for everything else. If they think that the Bible has the words of God but is not the word of God, then pretty much you can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. You can pick and choose what you like and what you don't like, you can let go. Because after all, it's, just, it's a great document. We can learn these stories are phenomenal stories, but you can't take them literally. There was really no crossing of the Red Sea. And Jesus was a great moral teacher. Da, 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 go on and on and on about that. And so that's what they do. Or you're a person that believes, yes, this is the word of God. And we live by this word. And we die by this word. And we're, that's our standard. And so if you really believe the Bible is the Bible, that we don't have the quote-unquote luxury to pick and choose what you and I like. You either live by the word or you don't. If you hear the words of God and don't do them. So the Bible is an authoritary. It is amazing. And you know, and, and the thing is this. I know this is a bit subjective. I can't help it. But the Bible comes alive when I read it. And the men, millions of people around the world through generations and millennia, when they read the word of God, it transforms them from the inside out. No other book have I ever read that reads me and speaks to me. It is alive because I'm of God. And so, if you're of God. So, what do we do as we conclude our time? Is 2 Timothy 3, 12 to 17. I gave you only a part of the verse. I'm going to give you more of a context now. All right? I hope this is helpful this morning. Rather than talk about a social issue, let's talk about how we determine what's right and what's wrong. 2 Timothy 3, 12. Yes, this one you want to memorize. This is an exciting scripture. You're going to love this scripture. I'm sure you all have it memorized anyhow. I'll go read it to you. Don't you love this one? 
2 Timothy 3.12. Yes, all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be prosperous. We'll have a new car, a new house, kids on the honor roll. Is that what it says? Oh, nothing wrong with those things, by the way. But what does it say? Yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. If you're not being persecuted and challenged, then you probably aren't living the word. I'm not saying we act rude. But what's happening is our culture used to be closer to the Bible. However, we had glaring eras in the way our church was. We were, we were absolutely wrong in our treatment of African Americans. Absolutely horrific how we treated them. Totally wrong. But other eras we were correct in it. You don't throw the whole thing about because of a couple bad things. But it says this. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you've learned and have been assured of knowing from whom you have learned them. This is the Apostle Paul talking to Timothy and us. Verse 15. And from your childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, in Jesus Christ. Now we come to the famous verse some of us have heard before, and it's the following. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good word. And then we come to 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. And by the way, this is not going to be very politically correct for me reading this. But it's very important we don't just pick out one thing from the list. Read the whole list. And this is what the whole list says. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. There's a lot of deception going around today. Neither fornicators. What are fornicators? Fornicators are people that have sex that are not married. Period. Fornicators. No, idolaters. What are idolaters? People that worship idols. Maybe we don't have idols, per se, on your shelf, but people will worship things above God. Wealth, whatever it is. Idols. No, adulterers. You know what adulterers are? Adulterers are when you sleep with someone else that's not your spouse. Nor homosexuals. I think we know what that is, right? Nor sodomites. Nor thieves. You know what thieves are? People that steal. Yeah, people that steal. White collar or blue collar crime. Nor covetousness. I want what you have, and I gotta have it. That's covetousness. Nor drunkards. Not people who drink, but people who get flat out drunk as a skunk, right? Drunkards. Nor revilers. Nor extortioners. Will inherit the kingdom of God. Inherit means receive from. Does it mean they won't get the blessings from God, or does it mean they won't receive heaven? Do you want to play with that? I don't. I don't even want to come close to that. Listen to this, verse 11, and such were some of you. That's the good news, right? All of us, I think, come on, let's be honest here this morning. Out of that list, I, I've participated in a couple of those, covetousness, right, jealousy. A thief, I used to be a bank robber before I came became a pastor. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Verse 11, and such were some of you, listen to this, but you were what? You were washed. You were sanctified. In other words, you were made correct. You were justified. Though you screwed up, you were made right in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. In other words, if you're in this list today, listening or you're here, I have good news for you. You're not damned if you give your life to Christ, no matter how bad you were. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. There's not one that's right. There's no not one. If not for Jesus, none of us have the moral high ground to say that I'm better. No, if not for Jesus Christ, none of us could stand. But if you see Christ you receive salvation. It's that simple. What did Jesus have to say? Well, in Matthew chapter 7, it says the following. Verses 20. 
Again, I'm reading beyond the normal verses you normally read in, in the context. Therefore, verse 20, Matthew 7, therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does, or she who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, I pastored a church on Cheshire. We built a church in Cheshire, God. It doesn't say that, does it? I'm sorry. Many will say that day, Lord, Lord, we have, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name. Well, he's anointed. He's got to be of God. Have done many wonders in your name. And I, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. In other words, not doing what I said. Verse 34, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain descended and the floods came and the stock market crashed. I'm sorry. And the winds blew and beat on the house. It did not fall for it was founded upon the rock. But everyone who hears you saying the mind and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand and the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and the beat on that house and it fell. Great was its fall. You see, all of us are gonna face a storm one time or another. Some of us will face storms because of sickness, because of issues in your house and, your, and, and what are you building your life upon? Some of us will experience storms because things will happen in our society, such as persecution, which we have people here this morning that understand persecution in Iran. But ultimately, even if you don't have personal storms, even if you don't have uh, persecutions, one day there will be a great storm. You're going to have to stand before God. And whatever you built your house on will be revealed at that point. Did you build it on the rock? or just hearing the word and not doing it. That's what the Bible says. And you'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. You know, Jesus says the following. I, I do want to mention this a little bit. I mentioned it last week. I'll mention it again. I'm going to ask the worship team to make their way up as we prepare for communion as well. But in Matthew 19, just to talk about what the Supreme Court did, because you know what? We have Scripture. So the Bible says this, for a reason, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become what? One flesh. So then they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man or Supreme Court separate. It's not God's plan. It's not his best plan. Well, what do you do then? Look what he says in Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So what do we do with this? Not, I, I, why am I talking about this one issue? I, I'm not talking about that one issue. I hope you realize that. But it's an issue that is being revealed today in our society. I heard people say this. Well, God made me this way. I was born this way. God doesn't make mistakes. Therefore, it's okay. I have news for you. I was born selfish. I was born lazy. I was born a liar. I was born all kinds of things. That is the way I am. I can't help it, right? There are people, and I want to say this to you, this service as well, as I did the last service. I think we need to be compassionate. There are some people that struggle with various things. Some people struggle with their weight. Some people struggle with anger issues. Some people struggle with a drug, like they have an alcoholic type of thing, and they, they're, they're addicted to everything. They have something, they get addicted. Some people struggle with their weight. They're bulimic or anorexic. They don't want to be that way, but they struggle against it. There's some people that struggle with their sexual orientation. They, they, they don't know why they're attracted to the opposite sex and are not attracted to the opposite sex. They're attracted to the same sex, right? There are people that are attracted to other things I don't even want to mention in this room. And the Bible talks about it explicitly. I'm just born that way. I can't help it. That's the way I was born. My friends, all of us were born sinners. All sin separates us from God. Thank you very much. So what's the, what's the answer to this? The answer is this, have compassion. Because you are a sinner too, saved by grace. Because you gave your life to Christ and you're now a saint with a sin problem. But all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. 
And so out of love, we must speak the truth or it's not love. If you tell somebody, hey, go ahead and build your house on the sand and then a hurricane comes and they die, why didn't you tell me? I didn't want to hurt your feelings. Yeah, now I'm destroyed. An act of love was to tell them the truth. My, my friend, what you're doing, you're hurting yourself. One day you're going to have to face God. Are you ready to face him? Listen, by God's grace, I can face him today. That's love. To say, oh, it's okay, is not love. It's selfishness because you're afraid you might be persecuted. There's a way to say it, folks. Let me say this. Can Cornerstone be a place where someone comes in as bulimic or anorexic, they can get the help they need by a loving community that will say, listen, we're going to help you through this? Can Cornerstone be a place where someone who struggles with alcohol and can't seem to get a hold of it can come here and we'll say, listen, we'll help you out? Can Cornerstone be a place where someone who struggles with a sexual orientation, they're struggling, like, can they come here and say, can I get prayer? Can I have fellowship? Can I have a place where it can be, I can be safe? Or are we going to point the fingers that you're going to hell in the handbasket? You see, sin is sin. But we must be a people that live by the Bible. And as Joshua said, I say, as for me, Sandra, and my children, Luke, Hannah, and Matthew, we will serve the Lord. And as the pastor of this church, we will serve the Lord. We will stand on the Word of God. This is our standard, not public opinion, not Supreme Courts, not laws. And if they have to shut us down, then they're going to have to shut us down because I will not relent from obeying God, and neither will you. Now, I need to say something else. Not in the first service. Sorry, first service. Listen, we're not called just to sit there and let stuff happen. The Apostle Paul was a Roman citizen. He was beaten. He said, hey, I'm a Roman citizen. You have no right to do that. The Apostle Paul had very few rights. The Roman law and the Roman government back in the day, Apostle Paul, wasn't even close to us today. We have representative form of government. We can petition our leaders. We can have civil cases. We can, we can uh, elect people. We can make changes. We can, we can make laws. We can do all sorts of things, right? Well, we better do our job. Don't get upset, wring your hands, post something on Facebook, and go on with your merry life. I'm asking God, God, what do you want our church to do? How about the school system you're in? How about say, hey, I'm a Christian here. We love you guys, but you know what? Subjecting my child to this is wrong. We have rights too. Do you know what? I have a lot of admiration and respect for the homosexual agenda that has happened in this country. I can learn a lot, so can you. Look at it, 3% of the population. Look, at the, look what happens when you come together in unity. They put aside their differences. And they focus on the main thing of what they try to do. And look how they affected entertainment, politics, education, the church, right? Why? They were unified. What are we? We're divided. Why? Over silly stuff, right? What would happen if the church believed the Bible, worked together, and set up getting angry and posting things on Instagram? That's okay, but why don't we do something about it? What are you supposed to do? Well, first of all, why don't you try voting? Money, you don't even vote. Are you even registered to vote? I'm not going to embarrass you to ask you to raise your hand. Probably you've not. Well, what's the difference? But we know what? It does make a difference. Have you ever wrote your, wrote your senator? Your congressman? Have you ever gone to a school board meeting? Have you ever gone to a town meeting? What happens if we get organized? and say, we're going to be salt and life. We love our country, and we're going to do our part as citizens. God has given us a gift called democracy and a republic. If we don't exercise our rights, we're going to lose our rights. We're not in Rome. We're in the United States of America. Does that make sense? I'm hoping we could get organized. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not running for president, okay? <laughs> no, I wouldn't. Believe me, I wouldn't want that job. God would have to come down and, oh, my Lord. Okay, but seriously, folks, listen, I, I hope this makes sense to you today, because you know what? If we're just going to sit here and talk about the Bible says, well, why not make a difference? God has called us to be salt and light. God has called us to make a difference in this planet. And if we're not going to sit around and wait for Christ to come back, he said, he said what? 
He said what? He said what? It's not for you to know the times, but go. God never said stay. He said go. He never said huddle in a circle and talk about how bad Rome is. He said no, go. Make a difference. What difference can I make? Wherever God's placed you, you can make a difference. If you're a school bus driver or a CEO or a student, you can make a difference. In love, in humility, let's be a church and a people that stands on the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Thank you for being attentive today. I want to conclude today with communion because you know what? All of us have sinned. If not for Jesus Christ, none of us could stand. What did Jesus do? The whole thing of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is all about Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He paid, this, he paid the price for our sins by hanging on the cross, paying God's a just God, and he hung on a cross for us and said, it is finished, paid in full. So now you and I, when we have sinned, whether it be covetousness, drunkenness, homosexuality, um, adultery, fornication, whatever it is, sin is sin, folks. It separates us from God. You can go to God and say, God, I've sinned. I ask you to forgive me my sins. I give my life to you. Or when you're a Christian, you still backside, make mistakes. You see what you do? Go before God. God, I've sinned. I write a check. I, I go into the, the check of heaven, the account of heaven of our Jesus Christ, and by faith I write, I, for, I ask you to forgive me, and I place my trust on you. You know what that does? It forgives you of your sin. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins. We're not perfect people, folks, but we are a people that trust in God. So I'm going to pray a prayer right now. If you want to pray the prayer from your heart, today can be a new beginning. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for me. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And I choose from this day to follow you. In Jesus' name. Can you do that this morning if you haven't done it? That's what it's about, folks. It's about giving your life to Jesus Christ. It's about surrendering. It's not being good enough. He takes you just the way you are, but he has got so much better plans for you. What did the Bible say? He was broken that we could be whole. So, Father, in Jesus' name, we take communion right now. We thank you for dying on the cross for us, that you were broken for us. We take this now in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name, amen. What washes away our sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What makes us whole again? I love that old song. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Christ sets us free. Christ is our healer. And we say something else. I need to say every single time we do this. If you have not forgiven somebody else, if you're holding unforgiveness or bitterness towards anybody, get it right today. Because if you drink this and don't get forgiveness, you're drinking judgment upon yourself. Because everything of Christianity is based upon forgiveness. The Bible says some of you have gotten sick because and even died because you've taken this in an unworthy manner. How we treat each other is important. So forgive and you'll be forgiven. Drink. Amen. Let's all stand if we could please. I'm going to ask Esteban to lead us in a closing song. As we do that, we're going to ask you to, uh, the, the prayer team to make their way up. If you prayed a prayer today to give your life to Christ for the very first time, or uh, rededicate yourself, please come forward and tell somebody today. Fill the card out, and, uh, and we'll, we'll pray with you. Let's just have one last song as we do that. Prayer team, make your way up. We'll pray for you for any reason at all. If you need health, healing, whatever it is.
even so come, Lord Jesus, come, even so. May the Lord bless you, may he keep you, may he shine his face upon you, and may you walk in the power and the grace of the Holy Spirit. Enjoy his presence with joy in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. God bless you guys. Thank you.